Welcome back, word nerds. Mike here with the social life of language, making complex series simple, but never simplified. If you think that sounds cool, hit that subscribe button now. Today we'll be covering an article that I wrote with translanguaging scholar Ophelia Garcia, and it's called Converse Racialization and Unmarking Language, the Making of a Bilingual University in a Neoliberal World. Today we'll be introducing a new theory we call Converse Racialization, and we'll be looking at the public conversations surrounding the newly opened and freaking giant bilingual university in the state of Texas. Now bilingual universities exist all around the world. But in the United States, not so much. We have a country where to assimilate, you have to speak English. Your yeah. staff yeah. is speaking Spanish to customers when they no, should be speaking English. Very much. I pay for their welfare, I pay for their ability to be here. Talking that stupid Spanish around here. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists. This is a country where we speak English. Yet somehow it happened. We have opened a bilingual institution that happens to be the second largest Hispanic serving institution in the United States. And in the freaking conservative state of Texas of all places. So how was that possible? Let's find out. So this article analyzes the public conversations through a lens we call converse racialization. And what's super important to this theory is that we think about language and race as concepts that have historically emerged from each other. Yet, as we will see, at times these concepts, language and race, are treated as though they are entirely separate, entirely unrelated entities. In fact, I would go as far as to say that converse racialization is about disconnecting language from race. But let's take it slow. Let's start with the word racialization by itself. Racialization refers to the historical process where there is some powerful political group interested in making connections between ideas of race and inferiority to a group of people and anything that they do, whether it be their language use or their morality or their purity or their cognitive ability. This racialized group of people and anything that they might do is imagined to deviate from what is normal. And as I say quite frequently on this channel. What is normal often refers to practices taken as the norm from a white perspective. We usually end up calling this the unmarked norm, as in not marked as different or distinctive. So racialization entails the historical processes by which something or someone becomes marked as deviant or marked as deviating from a norm. So let's review a tiny history of racialization and the university we're talking about, the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. So this university is located on the Texas-Mexico border, way, way south Texas. It's it's actually about a hundred years old, but has been renamed and reopened many times. Gloria Ansaldúa actually attended this university when it was called something else. And it even comes out in her Borderlands book. Specifically, she talks about a moment of linguistic terrorism called the speech test. And this was basically where Mexican students lined up for some university actor and were forced to speak out loud. From here, this would supposedly prove that they needed remedial speech classes to fix their accents. Now this test was rooted in what scholars call the deficiency perspective, or the idea that Mexicans and Mexican Americans are always deficient, whether it be in their knowledge of languages, or their mental capacity, or their morality, or their racial purity. Over time, this solidified into the general idea that Mexicans were inferior. Oh, and here's a fun fact. The state institution called the University of Texas was actually involved in producing some of this scientific research that proved Mexicans were inferior. And a lot of this research had to do with language. So we can call all of that like a mini history of racialization or the marking of Mexicans and Mexican Americans as inferior or deficient. But now in 2015, the university has reopened itself as an officially bilingual institution. During a time of some serious public anti-immigrant sentiment, how does a university sell the idea of bilingualism 
and Spanish if they are viewed so negatively in the United States? Well, this is why we develop a theory of converse racialization. If racialization is the process of marking something as deviant, then converse racialization is the process of unmarking something or the incorporation of something seen as deviant into the norm. If you notice in the title, we use a slash in the word unmarking. This is to signal that racialization and converse racialization happen together. When we mark something as deviant, we are simultaneously creating an unmarked norm. Now at some point, I became obsessed with the process of making something appear normal or how something achieves the unmarked status. So in that sense, my idea was kind of simple. Let's turn unmarkedness into a process, into the process of unmarking. Let's look at what makes something invisible from the perspective of the white institutional gaze, or as we say in the article. So in this case, we are trying to sell the idea of English-Spanish bilingualism, but it's attached to a very negative racial history. So what does an institution have to do to make something unmarked. So right away in the abstract to the article, we say, converse racialization as the equal and opposite co-constituting underside of racialization shifts the directionality of semiotic indexes away from a particular race or ethnicity, including whiteness, and produces a state of unmarkedness. So what does that mean? We'll be looking at a marked thing, and this could be anything, a group of people, a language, an activity, and then attempting to disconnect or erase all of the racial baggage to make it appear normal, neutral, and apolitical. This means we don't want English-Spanish bilingualism to point to or to index a so-called Mexican race or people who live in poverty or immigrants. And we also don't want to remind people of racial domination in the United States. Specifically, we don't want to remind people of white supremacy. We want to disconnect all that baggage to make something appear normal. So how about instead of framing Spanish and English Spanish bilingualism as languages that a racialized group uses and instead frame it as an economic resource or literally as a skill that anybody could acquire and, you know, supposedly get good jobs anywhere in the world. And this is where it gets really interesting because as soon as you frame it as an economic resource, suddenly you got freaking Texas Republicans supporting the idea of a bilingual institution. This is the University of Texas one of three campuses in the state. Sergio Sanchez is the chairman of the local Republican Party. For me, it's a marketable skill, and I would desire that of all the kids that are going to the university. And because it is an international market and international trade because of NAFTA, it's beneficial. So you got all those business words in there. You got marketable skill, international trade, good for the economy, NAFTA, all of that business and economic language. Now the students who attend this university, the super duper majority of them are from the region and have lived there their whole lives. But notice how there's no talk about becoming bilingual to resist Americanization or to hold on to our heritage or to combat the deficiency perspective. All of that stuff gets pushed way to the background. Now check out this faculty member talking about economic opportunity. And so that gets at the heart of why is this class important, right? A person with two languages is worth two people. If my students are going to get a nursing degree and they can speak English and Spanish, they will be hired anywhere along the border and anywhere in large cities. So this article is not about this professor at all, nor his political positions. What's important to think about is how this media story shapes Spanish and bilingualism into an economic resource. It's making explicit connections to a global economy. It's not about family or culture. It's about creating a global worker while indirectly disconnecting English-Spanish bilingualism from Latinxes in the United States. So those are just tiny moments of unmarking, of converse racialization. This is about framing bilingualism in a way that makes the university appear competitive. But here we run into another problem. Hispanic-serving institutions are always framed 
as underperforming. There is that deficiency perspective again. In fact, some universities closet their identity as an Hispanic serving institution because it's viewed as the opposite of being a prestigious university. So like I said, UTRGV is the second largest Hispanic serving institution in the United States. And that deficiency perspective could lead a whole lot of people to think of the university as the opposite of competitive. So how about we attempt to unmark the university by selling English-Spanish bilingualism as the competitive edge this university has over all other universities? For example, the provost at the time is quoted in the newspaper saying, I think this is going to make us unique around the country. We have not found another example of a bilingual university in the United States. And another administrator said, when we do this, other people will say, not only is this interesting, not only is that compelling, but that gives them a competitive edge. People are always looking for a competitive edge in all walks of life. So in other words, we want to bring this bilingual institution into the realm where we expect people and corporations and institutions to behave competitively. Because at this moment, competitive behavior is the unmarked norm. So the idea is to forge a connection between bilingualism, the university, and competition. Again, this is the process of converse racialization, or the institutionally backed trajectory toward a state of unmarkedness. In this case, we're trying to disconnect Spanish and bilingualism from the racial history of the United States, from the idea of Latinx poverty, from the idea of Latinx deficiency. But remember, achieving an unmarked status does not happen in a couple of interviews. It happens slowly and over time. It requires a larger shift in the conversation. So the point of this article is to identify all these tiny moments of converse racialization, of unmarking something. So sometimes it's a couple of quotes in a newspaper. Other times it's language departments framing Spanish as a global language, as modern and foreign. Other times we see moments of unmarking in university mission statements or in strategic plans and documentation, but it all adds up. So for fun, let's think of an alternate framing the university could have used. What if the university had publicly stated that the reason they were adopting Adopting bilingualism was specifically to battle racism, to battle the deficiency perspective, to battle the history of white supremacy in the United States. What if they said, we're going to treat Spanish not as a foreign language, not as a global language, but as a domestic language. Because at one point in this region of Texas, English was the foreign language there. What if the university said, our goal is to reverse the systematic linguistic terrorism that our children have experienced over the last 200 years. One of the main reasons why younger generations, including myself, did not learn Spanish growing up. I mean, just imagine if those were the stated goals of the bilingual institution. But you know, that didn't happen. Publicly, it's all about competition. It's all about creating competitive bilingual graduates. It's all about creating a global workforce. But let's make one thing clear. This is a major achievement. This article analyzes the surface level public marketing of the university. We have an army of scholars and researchers doing real work on the ground. These people are fighting against the deficiency perspective. We have faculty members reimagining what a first year composition course could look like. We got faculty pushing for ethnic studies programs and Mexican American studies programs. There are even faculty members creating translanguaging dual language programs in the public schools of the region. There is an army of researchers living there and doing the hard work. But just as another faculty member told me, every move toward dethroning white supremacy and dethroning the deficiency perspective, there are counter moves by people higher up the ladder, in higher administrative positions that have a keen interest in keeping things just as they are. Well, that's all for today, folks. I'll put some links down below so you can have direct access to this article. As usual, follow me on Twitter and academia.edu. And don't forget to donate to the Patreon account. This is Mike with the Social Life of Language. And we're done.